The following program is a special presentation of the Big Ten Network, produced in association with the University of Iowa. Coming up in this episode. This was an unprecedented event that had never been seen before. 1993 was frankly crushed by the 2008 flood. We had to accelerate what we were doing. No one was giving up. It was time for ordinary people to get involved. We'll be dealing with the consequences of this flood for years to come. Next on Iowa Magazine. Spring 2008, the University of Iowa. After a long winter, the campus transitions to summer. With a new university president, the outlook is positive. We were looking forward to the sustainability initiative becoming a big part of what we were going to be doing next year. I had had a, a really tremendous year of learning about the university, learning about its people, uh, and I'm glad I did that. Iowans are accustomed to severe weather in spring, and as meteorologist Joe Winters explains, 2008 sees its share. First of all, we recall the winter. We had uh, very, very heavy snows. In fact, record snows in many locations or near record snows, uh, upwards of 60 inches. Because of that, um, that left the ground very saturated across much of Iowa and throughout the upper Midwest. Secondly, we had very, very heavy spring rains. We had rains of 6 to 12 inches across some portions of southern Minnesota, northern Iowa as we moved through spring in a very short period of time. All that started to feed into the river valleys. It is actually the configuration of that river network, all the small creeks and, and bigger creeks and small rivers and bigger rivers that collectively determine how that surface runoff will propagate downstream. When all these events you know, come together in, in the right way, so to speak, then you have a flood, a big flood. The first six months of 2008 will be the wettest in Iowa history. With a major river running right through campus, University of Iowa administrators pay close attention. We knew that we had a saturated ground as the spring started, but as the rain kept coming, we started to get levels rising in the reservoir north of us. That reservoir is formed by the Coralville Dam, upstream from Iowa City. Yeah, the Coralville Dam plays a very important role for the Iowa City, Coralville, and University communities because it's a flood control reservoir that allows a great deal of the precipitation to accumulate in the reservoir. So as the water comes down the Iowa River, it is expected to hold water and be released at certain rates to hopefully prevent flooding farther downstream. As heavy spring rains push the river to flood stage, the UI takes measures to protect the campus. We benefited enormously from a flood emergency response plan that we developed a few years ago. It was really building on the experiences of the 93 flood. The record flood of 1993 reached 100-year levels and informed the university's response plan. We learned a lot, as did the communities of Iowa City and Coralville from the 1993 flood. As sandbag dikes are built, the low-lying arts campus is evacuated, along with most of the art museum's valuable collection. We were hoping that at the time would be the worst decision we made, that we put everyone through this inconvenience and it not be necessary. What it turned out to be was an effort that saved uh, millions of dollars in assets. On the east bank as well, sandbagging activity accelerates as the river continues to rise. We spent a lot of time trying to, to fortify the union. Similarly, in the advanced technology laboratory, what could we move out of harm's way in that lab? It was clear that we were going to see something unprecedented, and it was coming, and it was coming very quickly. When forecasts exceed 1993 records, buildings that were out of harm's way, like the main library, are suddenly at risk. We began to get concerned when music and art began, uh, were evacuated back around June 9th. Uh, the basement of the main library, I should explain, is literally um, probably ceiling to floor full of collections. As sandbag walls go up outside, volunteers inside the library move valuable materials to higher ground. We wanted to try to get the, the materials that we were most concerned uh, would not be replaceable. No one was giving up. No one ever thought about stepping back and just saying, here comes the water, let's just get out of the way. That was never part of the thinking. But as the output from the dam increases, the situation downstream becomes dire. 
We had to accelerate what we were doing, and that's when we called in contractors and volunteers and National Guard. We stepped it up uh, several degrees, and we were literally racing. An army of volunteers is mobilized, but will it be enough to stop the river? Coming up, the situation goes from bad to worse. We were talking about record levels 10, 12 feet above where it's ever been seen before along the river. We were beyond the plan at that point, and we were reacting in the moment. I said, frankly, Governor, we could use help. Next on Iowa Magazine. In June 2008, at the University of Iowa, all eyes are on the swollen river, which is now expected to surpass 1993 records. UI administrators pay close attention to forecasts. Once the water is accumulated in the reservoir, tracking the peak of the flood downstream is relatively easy. Uh, the more difficult aspect of the forecast really lies in the precipitation and understanding what the weather patterns will be and the runoff uh, from the watershed upstream is a more challenging process. Even in the weather, if you're forecasting record lows or record highs, it's very hard to go much higher than what the record was because it's just that, it's never been seen before. Yet we were talking about record levels 10, 12 feet above where it's ever been seen before along the river. We were well protected for the 100-year flood. It's when the river became much more than the 100-year flood that we were beyond the plan at that point and we were reacting in the moment with the information that was ever-changing. The difficult aspect of that was that the flood levels being forecasted for this area continued to rise as the week went along. So as the sandbag levees were being built, they had to go back and, and rebuild those to higher elevations. In some places, we built the wall three times. We initially built it with sandbags, we pushed the sandbags away, we put the Jersey barriers, put the sandbags around that, and then brought in the third level another row of Jersey barriers in and put these HESCO barriers on top of that. None of that could have been done without the help of a, an enormous volunteering effort. And we watched that volunteering effort grow daily. The university's call for volunteer help brings people from around the community to the campus. We just started to get the feeling that something extraordinary was going on. It was time for ordinary people, if not pastime, for ordinary people to get involved. We called everybody and said, what are you doing? Let's go sandbag. I mean, there's nothing else to do. And everyone wanted to help. And that was the, you know, kind of the easiest way. We wanted to do what little we could do, because this is one of those situations where you do feel somewhat powerless because you can't stop the rain, you can't stop the river. Um, I wanted to do what I could to help uh, protect the city uh, writ large. So I enjoyed it, and there were, I can't remember how many people were there, but I would say at least a couple of hundred, if not more. And people of all ages, you had older people, you know, men, women. The stark contrast of young women next to Amish, next to prisoners, next to anyone else who had come down there to volunteer, and the community spirit that this built. I mean, everybody was in this. Along the river, crews and volunteers work side by side, for safety and security reasons, the university suspends all classes and operations. Non-essential employees are asked to volunteer, but in areas like the arts campus, it may not be enough. We were only six inches from breaching our dike system on the west campus, and uh, it wasn't but a few hours later that the water started coming in on the west side. With the entire arts campus flooded, efforts now focus on what can still be saved, and the following morning brings the largest turnout yet of volunteer help. It became even bigger. We doubled the number of, of volunteers, 2,000 volunteers on one stretch of 10 blocks. We were just astonished at how many people showed up. I mean, just literally hundreds of people showing up to help us get those books out of the basement. As efforts are redoubled, Iowa's elected officials visit Iowa City to lend their support. The governor, with our two senators and our congressmen, all came to campus that day. Uh, the governor, I think, has shown amazing leadership through this entire crisis. He called me and he said, are you getting what you need? And I said, frankly, governor, we could use help. And he said, I'm sending the National Guard. And had they not come, uh, we wouldn't have been in nearly the kind of shape that we were when the water finally crested. With the river levels still rising, efforts focus on protecting the main IT hub and data center. 
When the university's power plant goes offline, measures are taken to ensure critical systems can still run. When we knew the power plant was likely to go down, we brought in temporary boilers, planted them on each side of the river, and our crews began to build, in effect, build a power plant in three days. A really remarkable effort by our folks on the ground. When all possible precautions have been taken, the volunteer efforts halt, and the community can only watch and wait. Coming up, the historic flood leaves behind unprecedented damage. We knew it would be bad after the floodwaters crested across the area. This is a long road we're on. It is just awful. We've never had flooding of this magnitude in the state of Iowa before. Next on Iowa Magazine. In June 2008, the University of Iowa faces the aftermath of the worst flood in recent history. As muddy waters start to recede, the UI community surveys the damage. We believe 1993 was a high water mark. It was going to be the sample for flooding planning at that point. 1993 was frankly crushed by the 2008 flood. We knew it would be bad after the floodwaters crested across the area. As they say, water always wins, and indeed we're seeing those effects right now. Despite the considerable damage to Iowa's campus, flooding is far more severe in other Iowa communities. Cedar Rapids was uh, extreme. Uh, over 4,000 uh, homes had to be evacuated. Uh, probably, it sounds like half of those homes may not be able to be reoccupied. Hundreds of businesses uh, had to be evacuated. City Hall, the downtown uh, Cedar Rapids Library, the police station, the sheriff's office. We also had other cities uh, such as Columbus Junction and Oakville that were, were terribly devastated. Almost entire communities uh, were flooded. So we've never had flooding of this magnitude in the state of Iowa before. The Iowa City floods and the Cedar Rapids floods, both tragic and both uh, uh, very dramatic, were different mainly because we have a reservoir and a dam north of Iowa City. So in this case, it was wonderful that the Coralville Reservoir was attenuating the flood, storing a great deal of water in the reservoir while the people downstream were able to prepare, sandbag, and protect their various facilities. But you also notice it takes a longer period of time for that water to also fall in Iowa City, which I mean, can be good and bad. Number one, it does give people more time to prepare for uh, the high levels that we saw. Yet that water stayed in those areas for a longer period of time, which can continue to do more damage because you just can't get it out of the building as fast as you'd like to to start that recovery process. That recovery starts immediately as UI administrators and engineers begin the process of cleanup and repair. Essentially, it's, it's going in and assessing the, it, the risk. Is there any hazardous materials? Is there any structural damage? How safe is the environment for workers to go in there and recover the building? We hired uh, two of the largest uh, recovery companies in the nation to bring them in. They began to do a cleanup work, a severe cleanup work. Staffs of 400 scour the affected parts of the campus and then go through a muck out process, as they call it, where they begin to clean all of the surfaces in these buildings, tear out the drywall that might be affected, those kinds of things. We will have metal studs and concrete walls and concrete floors left to dry out when the cleanup effort is, is completed. At the main library, where flooding was minimal, there is still a risk for damage to materials. We're a little concerned because of temperature variations they've had in the building that um, we may be developing mold. You begin to create a, uh, a very wonderfully ripe environment for mold and, and mold love books. There is just nothing like cleaning up after flood. It is just awful. Cleanup crews and workers must take precaution against health risks as they recover flood-stricken areas. Chris Atchison is director of the University Hygienic Laboratory, a testing facility and statewide resource for public health. I think the major risk is, is from the contaminated water, and that's why what we're stressing right now is uh, uh, for uh, ensuring that the water supply is restored to a healthy state. The Hygienic Lab provides valuable water testing to thousands of Iowa residents. I think in May of this year, we did maybe 46 uh, tests for water. Uh, in June, uh, we did uh, over 3,000 tests uh, of water. In addition to property damage and health hazards, there is a psychological toll as well on those affected by the flood. 
There can be emotional loss too as people uh, recognize uh, things that they've literally had their whole lives that uh, may be destroyed at this point, mementos. So I think uh, mental health is one of those perhaps hidden longer term uh, health consequences of this flood. We sustained a lot of damage to property, to things, but it wasn't all of our personal belongings. It wasn't as personal as it is for those people who lost their homes. Uh, those are the people that my heart really goes out to. On the UI campus and in surrounding communities, there are numerous challenges in getting back to business. We have begun the recovery uh, process already. Construction contracts are already underway. The work will be considerable and will be long, but uh, we're, we're well into it now. We're getting up and we're gonna get back to, to uh, business that's not normal. It's gonna be better than normal. Despite the optimism and flurry of activity, the recovery will be a long one. This is a long road we're on, and um, it, it could take us several years easily to get back solely on our feet to where we were you know, three or four weeks ago. This is not an event that's done by any means um, across eastern Iowa or the Midwest that's experienced the flooding. I think the most remarkable uh, thing about floods is how long they last and how broad their impact is we'll be dealing with the consequences of this flood for years to come. Coming up, the recovery begins, but has the threat of flooding really passed? You could have a hundred year floods three years in a row. Could it happen again this year? Absolutely. We should expect floods of this you know, magnitude much more often. Next on Iowa Magazine. As the University of Iowa and surrounding communities recover from the flood of 2008, both the public and policymakers seek to better understand the forces behind the event. A key part of this understanding, some say, is the expectations of how often floods should occur. It's important to remember when they talk about the 100-year flood, what that really means is that there's 1% chance in any given year that a flood of that magnitude will occur. So you could have 100-year floods three years in a row. The likelihood is not great, but that can happen. Could we see another flood like this? Absolutely. Could it happen again this year? Absolutely. Small percentage chance, but that chance is there. It's fairly obvious that the flood that affected Iowa City was not a 500-year flood. We should expect floods of this you know, magnitude much more often, much more than 500 years. <laughs> Changes to long-term planning and strategy are examples of this heightened awareness of the river and its potential. I think a lot of people, certainly us, are going to rethink what is the right benchmark to be designing to. Is today's 100-year flood really a 500-year flood? We are starting to convene a group of faculty and researchers on campus to talk about research strategies for living with floods. We're looking at these things now very critically and saying, what do we need to do for the future to make sure that we're not vulnerable? You know, rivers are very dynamic bodies, and if you didn't believe that before the flood, you certainly believe it now. Despite millions of dollars in damage and countless challenges ahead, UI administrators acknowledge the success stories of this event. We saved a lot more than was what was lost in terms of uh, impact to the university. Our losses are huge, but what we were able to, to save, uh, we feel very good about. Where sandbags were breached, uh, a lot of people were concerned about whether or not their work was in vain, and in fact, that wasn't the case. The sandbags, even if water got behind those sandbags, allowed for the buildings to endure water, but not the flow of the river, and that is where it can become very damaging to the structure of a building. So our buildings were, in effect, in a pond, not in the river. Frankly, without the outpouring of literally thousands of people, the sandbagging that occurred that protected much of the property uh, along the, the, the Iowa River uh, would not have been nearly as successful as it was. Volunteers made all the difference in the world in terms of what we were able to save 
going through this disaster. I think for me, what it, what, and for many of our staff, the real sort of success of this was a, 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 the reinforcement of all these people showing up on how important the library was to the university. Many of us were motivated by uh, these folks who didn't have to show up, showing up and putting in a very long day to help the university. Very uplifting. I don't think anybody involved in this effort will uh, soon forget that. Many who volunteered during the flood described the experience as uplifting in spite of the dire circumstances. I hate to say this because it was such a devastating experience for so many people who lost their homes or their property. Um, but in many ways, it was kind of a peak experience. You know, we were all focused on achieving a common goal for a common good. It was very moving to experience that. Just the idea that, that people really do um, care to come together um, and to do all we can to help, um, help sustain our community and our way of life. And so that was, that was encouraging to see that. Moving forward from the flood of 2008, the university embraces the challenge to better learn from this dynamic feature of the UI campus. We have technologies available today to do measurements that we didn't have years ago. So we were able to respond by making measurements of this event that I think will be very important for future research as well as planning for floods in the future. We have always looked at the Iowa River as a unique part of our campus and of our community and something that sets us apart. And we still do and it is, it's a beautiful river to, to visit. It, it, it bisects the east and west sides of our campus and is something that we want to celebrate and engage. I keep telling people that with adversity comes opportunity. Uh, and in fact, as we start to think about our issues moving forward, and particularly sustainability, which is an initiative that I've pushed hard for this year, I think water uh, is a logical focus for us. We already have a strength there, and uh, we have a living laboratory right out here in our backyard that only a university could see as an asset. The preceding program was produced by the University of Iowa in association with the Big Ten Network.